Hi and good evening and welcome back to the Music Technology in Education online conference brought to you by Music Teacher Magazine. Um, I can't believe now we're halfway through, um, but it does mean we've still got lots of really great sessions coming up uh, over the next two evenings. So it's been really great to see some familiar names for, the, for days one and two, um, and I'd like to extend a welcome to those who are joining again for the first time. Um, whilst we wait for people who are still joining from the waiting room, I'll just reintroduce myself. Uh, for those who haven't taken part yet, so my name's Georgia and I'm the conference manager for Music Teacher Magazine. Um, all the sessions will be recorded and if you'd like to replay any of the content from these sessions, uh, please note that the recordings are available via the uh, conference homepage for the next three months. You'll also have access to the um, handouts for any sessions whilst you watch the recordings, um, just on the little icon below when you're on the uh, video player. Let me just go back to my slides. There we go. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors again. So we had Music First, Music Insight and London College of Music Examinations. We don't have an exhibitor break today, but I will leave the chat open after the this talk has finished so you can um, network with each other or if you just want to pop off and get a cup of tea, then that's fine as well. Um, so it's been lovely to see you all talking to each other and sharing great tips and uh, advice and resources. So as always, you can get involved on Twitter using the hashtag MusicTech2020, um, and that's at Music Teacher Magazine. So before I hand over to our amazing panel, um, I'm just going to quickly, quickly run over the housekeeping, although I'm sure you're sick of hearing me uh, talk about it. So the chat panel on the right hand side, which I can see loads of you are already using, um, is available um, for you to talk amongst yourselves. If you've got any questions, please use the Q&A tab, which is at the top of the panel, um, and upvote any questions you really want to see answering. Please be polite and respectful at all times, as you all have been. Um, and at the end of the session, after the um, networking break, um, you'll be redirected onto the landing page for the next session, so don't close your browser. Um, finally, if you're having any technical problems, just try and refresh the page, and don't forget to click the screen um, to enable audio. So we've got a fantastic lineup of sessions today, starting with um, our panel. So I'm gonna hand you over to Kate Rounding, who's chairing the session, um, and she's going to introduce the other panelists um, and explain what uh, these brilliant women are going to be discussing today. So Kate, over to you. Thank you, Georgia, and uh, hello everyone, and welcome to our session, our panel discussion, Women in Music Technology, uh, Mastering Production and Innovation. Um, so we're going to be hosting this as a panel discussion. And uh, before I introduce our fantastic panellists, I'll just uh, let you know a little bit about myself. I'm Kate Rounding. I'm Development Director for Time Technology in Music Education UK. And Time is an alliance of music industry and educational organisations. Um, and we are supporting, I'm sure, our shared and collective uh, aim of raising awareness of music technology and its uh, benefits to music education in all its forms. So today, um, I'd like to welcome our three panellists. We have Rita Campbell, who is um, an, one of the UK's most in-demand singers. Um, and worked with many great artists, including Jules Holland and Written for Steps and many, many more. Um, and we have Katie Tavini, who is a mastering engineer, uh, known for her attention to detail and quality of production. And we have Amy Dickens, who is, amongst many other things, a researcher and developer of accessible digital musical instruments. Um, so I'm going to start by asking Katie to... Um, Tell us a little bit more about your work and what you do. What is mastering? What do you do? Yeah, okay. So um, I work as a mastering engineer and basically that's the very final step of the music production process. So it's basically three things. Firstly, it's a quality check. So you're checking that the mixers are all functioning well. Um, they all sound good. There's nothing kind of, you know, there's no like little talking that someone's forgotten to mute a mic or something. Because when people are sat with mixers for a long time, it's really easy to overlook things. Number two, it's audio processing. Um, this is actually the smallest part of my job, um, but it's the most um, fun part, I guess, um, and the most talked about part. 
And so you're looking to add like the extra, like little bit of sparkle to a production. And then number three is getting all of the formats ready for distribution um, and making sure that the artist has formats to go on all different sort of platforms. So like CD masters, vinyl masters, um, digital distribution, etc. So it's all those kind of things and you're basically tying up the project for it then to go to the label to send out into the world. Thank you, thank you, Katie. And uh, Rita, can you tell us a bit about what you're doing? Well, where Katie is at the end of the journey with mastering, I'm at the front end. So I'm a songwriter. So I work mainly uh, writing top lines, which is the melody and the lyric. Um, I am also a singer, um, a featured vocalist, which I've sung on many dance hits around the world um, and also as a session singer so I sing backing vocals and ghosting vocals on many artists um, albums and also uh, for singles um, and uh, I, I work on shows like X Factor, Britain's Got Talent, America's Got Talent, um, America's X Factor where I would provide all the backing vocals for when they go live, they have the live shows in the TV studio. Um, they don't sound like that. All the people miming in the background aren't really singing, they're miming to me. So that's what we do. It's all TV. And I would record all of that, a lot of the stuff here in my studio and then send it via the internet. So I'll be doing stuff for people I've never even met, but it goes over to America or goes over to somewhere else in another part of the UK. So I've basically been doing all of that for a very long time. Um, I'm also a vocal coach and um, I do a lot of vocal arrangements. So I'm, I'm, I'm in that, that area. Fantastic. Thank you. And Amy, what about you? Yeah, so where uh, Rita is in the actual beginning of the process and Katie's right at the end, I'm in the, the weird pre-process part where I'm developing and researching instruments that you would make music with digitally. So looking into specifically the accessibility of things, but I started out as an audio engineer um, and have moved into this field of computer science where I'm looking into how we create things using new technologies and what's, what, what works and what doesn't work in, in especially in performance spaces and recording spaces and all of that kind of stuff. So that's me. Fantastic. And do you actually you actually build? Are you there with the soldering iron and actually building the instruments, or is it more the design? No, uh, both. Uh, I've I've been with my. I'm not the best solderer in the world, so uh, you know, uh, only hobby projects and hackathons. Um. But yeah, I've done I've done a bit of both of those things using software, hardware. Um, just been testing the weird and wonderful for the last five years. So, yeah, fantastic. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we all progressed our careers, really, in music and music technology. Um, Katie, I think you said that it was more like doing a science degree when you did your degree. Um, yeah, it was very sort of experimental and it was very trial and error and sort of working out what worked and what didn't work. That was like a really big part of it. But uni gave me the freedom to make mistakes, which is really important um, because obviously you can't make a mistake on someone's record. <laughs> um, people get angry about that. But yeah, like it was definitely, it was a huge learning curve and it was more than just the taught stuff, like the actual practice of doing it was a huge um, learning curve for me and like watching all of the other people on the course because everyone wanted to specialise in something different. Like I'm the only person that's gone on to do mastering. And so learning from them and about the jobs that they wanted to do was really really cool and so yeah it was all just a bit of trial and error and working out what worked and what didn't work and you know very critical thinking so it's really good yeah great and did you find um uh, any of you really what did you find that there were any um particular moments that you thought actually this is 
what I want to do and any particular opportunities that came along that sort of set you off on that path? Is that to all of us or to yeah. <laughs> all well, of them? For me, it was when I got my first tour, like proper grown up tour, you know, up until because I started out in the industry really young writing songs and then just being really bolshy and bold and going oh, i've written this song it's brilliant play it on your radio show and they did and i got i actually got a radio interview at the age of 15 because I, I i quite fancied the, the radio guy that did the show and it was all about local talent and i thought well, he's a bit of all right i'll go and speak to him and i did and i got a radio interview and that set me off but so from and then i got into my first band and then I was sort of, you know, I was 15, 16, and doing like three, four gigs a week. I think starting young really helped for me, for what I do. And then before I knew it, I was sort of being asked to do sessions for people. And because I can mimic, you know, I was getting asked to do, oh, can you do this in the style off? And I thought, well, okay, so that I was using all of those to, to create a show reel. So I did a lot of stuff for free because it's not all about the money, because, you know, when you start out, you need experience and, you know, you can't be sort of pigeonholing yourself, you know, oh, I want to be a session singer. You don't become a session singer. You don't train to be a session singer. It happens, it evolves because, you know, you, you become really good and quick at something and you need to have practice in a studio. You need to do lots of sessions to be able to hone your craft and become good. And if that means doing favours for people, like I did a lot of favours and then they would do me a favour back. I, I'd say, yeah, I'll come and sing that TV thing for you or I'll sing that. And then I'd use that as a little snippet on my show reel. And then I'd go, and then I'd say, right, I did that for you. I need to record something. Can you record me in your studio for free? So favours for favours are really important as well. I did all of that. And then, you know, you end up, Okay, so I, I used all those show reels and made up a show reel, went to my first session agency at the age of 19 and said, Bosh, I can do all of this because I'd done a load of it by then. And I said, there, I, I, I can do this. And they said, great, we'll sign you up. Then I started getting all this. I was getting bookings, like proper grown up session work, you know, like someone's album. Um, someone wants you to go do backing vocals on the tour for Take That. And I was like, so I'd be going off and doing all this really exciting stuff, like grown-up stuff. And that that was when I knew I was playing Wembley, being flown around in a helicopter from 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 London up there. I'm, 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 in, a, I'm in a helicopter being flown up to Birmingham NEC because we'd just done a TV show in London and we couldn't do it in driving. So they flew us up. I'm sat in the back of this thing going, yeah, I've made it now. That This is like proper session work. I love this. And then you think, oh, I love this. And it keeps going. And it's all these experiences that you learn, you learn from. It takes time, but you have to keep sticking with it and meeting people and working with people. The more people you work with, the better you become, the more people you know. And then they, if they like working with you, they'll ring you up. And if you're easy to work with and nice, they will always ring you back, especially if you're good. And you've done it a lot. So you've become good. Do you yeah, not agree? Do you not agree, ladies? It's, it's in this industry. You've got to be. You know, it's no well, work as well. Like so, the more work you do, yeah. the more work you get. It's kind That's of right. yeah. And you have to work hard. I mean, you know, it, it's you don't just make it. You don't just suddenly get a. Oh, you're you're a master. You're a great mastering engineer. You have to go and do it for a very long time, and your ears and. And people then go, she's good. And it's word of mouth. And a lot of this is word of mouth. Oh, she's great. She's brilliant. You've got to use her. She did this. And it's like, oh, she did that. She must be good. So, you know, and that happens it's in this industry. It's, for a woman in this industry as well, you know, you, you, you sometimes do feel like you have to work a little bit harder sometimes, especially in a, a man's arena, probably for the mastering. You, you know, there's more men doing that than there are women. So it's almost like you do feel like you've got a little bit more to prove. And then once you've you, you've shown your work, it's like, woo. Uh, I think it, um, it's interesting that you mentioned that about in a man's world, because I know we've all spoke about this and, the, um, you know, different experiences for each of us. But 
what always amazes me um, because, you know, I've been working in music for 25 years or so and worked as a studio engineer uh, 20 years, 15 years ago. Um, and, and there were very few women uh, working in that, uh, that sector at that time, working in studios. But it amazes me to hear that that's still the case now, 15 years on. Um, Amy, is it, do you have the, um, is it 2% rising? Uh, that's with Katie, I think the 2% oh, yeah. rising. That, Sorry, Katie. <laughs> very much, yeah, the 2% um, figures of the industry is is uh, quite upsetting to read. And still, I think the last report was that, uh, yeah, 2% at production level. I think it's about 5% at audio engineering level. I know when I, so I did my degree in audio engineering, uh, started it about 10 years ago, finished it about, I think, eight six to eight years ago now and when I finished that degree I think I was one of four the four women that started on the course and like one of two that graduated uh so you know it's all the way through the process there's a there's a fight to stay in it and um and to be recognized as much as your peers as well I know that there's been definitely moments where I've had uh experiences where I'm compared to my peers or overlooked completely just because of being a woman and that you know at the time I was more naive to that uh, and I didn't realize that it was a gendered thing I just thought I had to work that bit hard or I needed to be one of the lads kind of thing I just kind of thought I had to fit in better and then I realized that actually no this is a problem across the whole industry and and that is it's, it can be frustrating at times, yeah. Um, but yeah, Katie has the 2% rising thing. I think that's really, really interesting to try and group people together. Yeah, can you tell us a bit about that, Katie? Yeah, so um, a friend of mine and I were sort of chatting over Christmas and we were just like, you know, there's loads of groups for women in music, but they tend to be predominantly sort of DJ aimed or radio that side of it rather than production and engineering and we were like we want to make you know we want to make a network but we don't know <laughs> um we don't know where there is a network already so we made this group called two percent rising um and we've got about 250 women who are producing and engineering in it um which is amazing and so we're working really really hard to do like skill shares and networking and um trying to share as many opportunities as possible to sort of help everyone get up the ladder a little bit quicker just to try and change that balance because it is depressing when you go to a networking event and someone goes oh are you an artist and it's like no why, why assume that like ask me what I do first like there's nothing wrong with being an artist but you don't want to hear me sing <laughs> <laughs> but there is always auto tune. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll coach you. Katie. I'll coach you. I'll get a out of you. I might have a career change now if you coach me, Rita. <laughs> there's, been, there's been so many people I know that have done it like that. So um, that's why Melodyne's my favourite plugin. But we'll get into that later. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, lovely. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I know we have all, all spoke about this and, and whether, you know, working in music technology or in uh, sort of predominantly male environments as they have been and, and apparently still are, um, whether that has been a barrier. Um, I mean, it's evident that it isn't because uh, everybody here has developed good, solid careers. Um, but... Uh, I mean, I know for myself that there was a difference between um, kind of banter and actual, um, oh, what's the word, uh, prejudice or um, discrimination, uh, and that there is a difference between that. And I know you've talked about that, Rita. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, there's a fine line, but, you know, I do think it's all gone a bit crazy now. So many people are so sensitive to banter what is actually in, a, in, in essence just banter and I think so many people are scared you know guys you know I go into a studio and there are a lot of men now that are just scared to say anything you know and it's like oh, I really wish they wouldn't because 
I, I don't have a problem. I give as good as I get. I'm, I'm, I could be accused of all sorts of things because I, I just say things in a studio. And, um, but nowadays, even I'm like, oh, maybe they take that the wrong way. You can't say, you know, I mean, it's just stupid things. Like even I, it's like that um, Coca-Cola moment, you know, in the old days, they'd have this really good looking guy and he'd, he'd take his top off to have a can of Coke, you know, that, but that those sort of things in a studio would be mentioned and regarding air conditioning and it would just be like nowadays no one can say anything like that but it's just funny and I do think that um yeah I think banter is misconstrued and now a lot of it but I've, you know I I've not come across any problems in studios to be honest and where there have been a few like comments uh, it tends to be like the old old school old old guys that would sort of come up with stuff like oh you know better turn the um better turn the uh, air conditioning uh, on because the uh, route is a bit cold in their vocal booth do you see what i mean you'd always get those and that's really old uh, and you just sort of like laugh and just go yeah well so would you be if you were cold you know you just say stuff like that but yeah the banter thing has changed definitely so I know one of my my favourite studio stories was the um, I was engineering and a, a a male colleague came in and literally pushed my hand off the desk, physically moved it, which all I could do was laugh really. <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, um, but obviously supporting um, you know younger women, young professionals coming into the industry. Um, I think it is important that. Uh, they have female role models in these environments um, and that they are aware of them and where to find them. Um, so groups like 2% Rising are very important. Um, and also, I suppose, the, the education that they have on that career journey development is very important. Um, just before we sort of move on, because I know we're going to open up to... Uh, some questions from the audience. Um, I wanted to ask each of you if there was at the moment a favourite piece of equipment, a favourite plug-in, a favourite technique you're using or something that we should be aware of and should be using at the moment. Amy? Uh, well, I'll, I guess I'll go with the more weird and wonderful side of life, which is um, I'm really enjoying the way that technology is allowing to use touch and gesture at the moment. So uh, there's some things called uh, the, the touch boards by Bear Conductive, where you can wire them up to pretty much anything you can imagine and make that into a musical instrument. Um, there's also uh, other ones called the Makey Makey. And at the very entry level, you can use the BBC micro bit for this as well. So there's kids out there that are getting to use the BBC micro bit to make 8-bit music. Um, by coding it themselves and they can use gestures and touch and all sorts of things with that too so yeah touch and gesture controlled things are really exciting for me right now because it's it's this new way in which we can turn anything into a music instrument and I think that's that's kind of fun wow. yeah brilliant very exciting and uh Katie um well for my job I like it's not creative in the same way um so I'm going to mention two things one is something I've seen really recently, which is um, a voice to MIDI mic called Bocclea. And that's amazing. That's so cool. <laughs> My friend Lena did um, did a video of it where she was basically playing the flute, but with her voice down this mic. And it was just so cool. Um, but obviously, I don't use that in my work. So I'm going to go with speakers. <laughs> um, they're so important to me, like I need to be able to hear everything and I need to be able to get right into the music. So um, yeah, good monitoring. I'm always like keeping an eye out on what, what new products are coming out and, um, you know, demoing new stuff. It's really important to me. Cool. Do you still do that thing of sort of taking the uh, the track outside and listening to it, to it on the car speakers as well? Um, well, I don't have a car, so no. <laughs> no, then. <laughs> I do have a car, but um, yeah, Brighton's a bit, a bit cramped, so. <laughs> we, we, used, we used to do that after mixes on a cassette, and it would go, you remember that? Obviously, you'd get the cassette, and you'd go, right, got to go and listen to it in the car. And that, that's, that was the case. Oh, it sounds good. Oh, no, it's too bassy. Or it's yeah. this. My favourite little bit of kit 
obviously I've said it before, is Melodyne. I'm amazed at Melodyne. I can't, I mean, you have to know what you're doing with Melodyne to use it properly, but I'm I'm in awe of that. I will study and learn how to use it properly because it's so, it's a brilliant bit of kit, especially if you're working with unpolished singers and artists. Um, you know, there's only so much you can get out of them uh, when you're coaching. But if you if you want to get that sort of processed, because everything's so processed now, all all records use it. You know, it doesn't matter how good the singer is; they tend to use Melodyne on everything. Mm. You can be the best singer in the world, so it's not really about the tuning. It's more it's just like a process sparkle that it gives. And I think we're so used to hearing it now. When when it's not on a record, Amy's nodding. You know, when it's not on a record, you know, it's like oh. Oh, it sounds weird. It's like, well, no, that's how it should sound. But it all sounds so sparkly now. But that I love. It's my favourite bit of kit. And I've just started using, I've always been a Pro Tools girl um, since I started with, with having my own studio many, many years ago. And, and now um, my my husband uses Logic, uh, Logic Pro X. So I've now started using that because he said, oh, it's really easy. Try it out. And it is. And I, I was like, oh, I was really surprised. So I'm, I'm hoping to be able to use two, both of them, to be able to switch, which would be, which would be nice. But yeah, Melodyne and um, Logic Pro is my name. <laughs> I like. And a good set of speakers, definitely. Or maybe as, two. As a singer, great mics. I've got a really brilliant mic. It's so important to have mic. And great headphones. When you're singing, you need really, you need to hear everything. And you know, if you're giving, if you're if you're working with singers, guys, don't give them DT one hundreds, which are for drummers. You know, I know you can stand on them and you can throw them out the car window and they'll get run over and they'll still work. <clears throat> They're not good if you're trying to hear all the intonation in your voice. You need something that's nice and bright and toppy and enclosed. So um, don't give us DT one hundreds, guys. Please. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> they're great, they're great. Don't get me wrong, my husband uses them, they're brilliant, but not for singers. Actually, um, being as we have got a little bit of time, Katie, what do you think about um, the sort of argument about with mastering about volume and compression and everything being loud um, and therefore lack of dynamics? <laughs> What's your thoughts on that? It's such a tricky one because when everything was being released on CD, you could, because of the format, have a very, very loud master, and that's fine. But now things are being released on streaming platforms. This goes really, really deep, by the way, so I'm going to whiz through it. <laughs> but basically, when you fold down um, a lossless file into a lossy file, you can get what's called inter-sample peaking, and that's basically distortion that happens and it sounds bad. So for streaming, it's really, really good to have a more dynamic master as well because dynamics are really nice <laughs> and they sound good. We like them. And when you listen to something that's very, very limited, it, your ears get very tired. I always feel a little bit as if I'm sort of underwater or something when I listen to a very, very limited master. Um, but having said that, if you heard a punk track that was that as dynamic as a classical record, you'd be like, what? This doesn't make any sense. So there's always a, a stylistic, um, you know, vibe that you have to play into. Similarly, like if you slammed um, a classical track through a limiter, it just sound weird. It's not what you expect. So within a genre, you sort of have to be, yeah, a little bit mindful. So dynamics are good in a nutshell. Often <laughs> it's bad. I'm relieved yeah. to hear that myself. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Because I know that there was a, a phase where um, people would come in to, uh, well, actually send a track for mastering and it was already just at maximum. And it's like, well, you can't really do much with that. Um, and just this loud all the time. So uh, dynamics are back, which is great. <laughs> Hi, Georgia. Hi. So there's been so many great questions. As you, um, you know, I'm sure you're not surprised at all. Um, and we've got about 10 minutes now where we can go through those. So let me just quickly whiz to the top of the Q&A. Um, 
one of your questions was talking about the tools you use, um, each of you, um, and I was wondering if maybe I can collect those from you, sort of uh, just a brief list, so I can put that together and share that as a handout, because one of the delegates has asked if we, if you know, if, if you guys can share the kinds of tools you use. And then as an actual question on top of that, someone's asked, where do you get the ideas for new kit and tools without getting overwhelmed with all of the advertising literature and obviously all the options? And that's to everybody. I go on word of mouth basically. If I'm if I'm at, if I'm at a studio, someone else's studio, I go, oh, I, I really like this. What is it? Then they'll tell me. It's word of mouth, and then you know, if, if I'm needing some something and I don't quite know what I want because obviously I'm not a tech head, but you know, I I will then ring up someone who does know and ask their advice, who knows what setup I've got up here. And um, he's great. He's, he comes straight over and sort of says, well, you'll need this and this. This is great. It's a new bit of kit. So I, I tend to go through word of mouth and, and advice from people that really do know. Yeah, same. Always talking to other engineers about what they're using. And, you know, like, they don't really have time to try out loads of new stuff or read through marketing literature, which is no. boring, really. <laughs> so, yeah, always word of mouth. Um, if, you, if you're lucky, I, I was really lucky with the guy, I, I, when I was first trying, I, I didn't know which mic to get because each mic's different for, for different voices and I want, and, you know, I ended up with a U87 and I wanted the 47, but I ended up getting a 47 copy. So I've got all those lovely mics. But before that, I was really fortunate because he, he, he managed to arrange for me to try the different stuff. You know, it, you, you, you can go and try things as well if you want to know what's right certain shops will allow you to go in and use their studio inside to try. I mean, I went through loads of mics. I ended up going with what I went with because it was industry standard, plus it was best for my voice. And I think it's the same with headphones. You, you, can, you, can, you can get people to even deliver you stuff if, if you get, get a good relationship going with people, I think is really important as well. Don't be afraid to ask. We're always learning. There's nothing wrong with that. People will always want to help you. That's true, I found for me. Great, yeah, so for the next, oh, sorry, Amy, you go. It's all right. Um, yeah, I found that too with the, even the more weird and wonderful music tech stuff. I've asked companies like, can I try this out? Can I put it into my testing sessions? And most people are quite forthcoming with saying, yeah, go for it. Um, I also ad attend like different events. So uh, now, which is the, I think it's the National Association of Music Manufacturers in, in America. I go to that event and I've spoken there and there's halls full of all sorts of equipment that you wouldn't believe. It's a cacophony of sound as you move through the event, but it's huge. It's like four or five miles of convention. And then also to things like Ableton Loop, which uh, just, you get to see like what's happening at the forefront of all the digital tech stuff at these kind of events so that's that's a really nice place to go and experience everything um but yeah it's it's definitely go on what people say oh have you tried this it's really good because if somebody's saying that to you then you you know that like yeah all the all the flashy lights and marketing material won't work with me it'd be like oh if somebody says it's good i'll use it so it seems to be a yeah, word of mouth and then asking people if you can test things out Good advice there. Um, for the next question, I'm going to combine two. So one from Kiriaki, one from Alicia. Both are uh, teachers. Um, they've said they're teachers uh, and they want to know for their female students whether you have any female role models in the music tech industry that you can recommend other than yourselves, obviously. Um, and also, um, you know, do you have any specific advice to motivate female students to follow this path as a career? Well, well, who's going to go first? I think we all, we've all got some <laughs> in terms yeah. of role models. Um, do you know I haven't got like a list of role models? Katie, you might have more knowledge of uh, women working in, in in music production, music technology. Yeah, so on the sort of recording and production side, there's Sylvia Massey, and she has um, a book called Recording Unhinged, which is really, really fun. And it's actually amazing for, like, all ages. Like, you could literally give a child that book, and they'd find something to love about it. And you could give someone who's been producing for 20 years that book, and they'd still love it. 
Um, she's got a microphone museum. She's doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And she's just, yeah, a really, really cool role model. Um, but I think like getting in, like getting on Twitter and stuff and just finding people is a really, really good way to connect. Um, there's, there's almost too many to name. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, maybe that's something we need to do and share with people so that they've got that resource because, uh, you know, that's a good point. And um, in terms of encouraging them, I would say, you know, as a, a young woman who wants to work in the music industry, wants to work in music technology, whether that's as a, a you know, a studio engineer or a live sound or whatever it is, um, I, I just do it. Just you know, find what the what the pathway is for you. Whether that's uh, through college, through university, um, and know that you, you're as capable as anybody else. Absolutely, yeah. I, I agree. Think also, sorry, sorry, you can also point to the the history as well, because for a lot of of people, they don't understand that a lot of the industry was built by women. You know, there are people who helped found the Radiophonic Workshop for the BBC, like Daphne Warham. There are people who created the first uh, Sonic computer program. There are people, like, they are all women. And it wasn't until later on that it became an industry that, like, those were overshadowed by men. So, uh, yeah, just look at the history and don't ever feel like you don't belong in an industry that was created by people who look and think like you. Yeah, totally. I think um, managing expectations as well. Like, there's quite a lot of pressure from parents to, you know, you finish uni and you get a job. That's mm -hmm. not really the case in the music industry. You don't really get a job. It's, you know, you get a gig and then you get another gig and then you get another gig. Um, so, you know, I'd say 90% of my colleagues of freelancers like me but that was like no one talked about that at uni um mm -hmm. and I've been doing this for like 11 years now and my parents still ask when I'm gonna get a job um yeah. <laughs> so it's a really big thing but I think not just for women but for anyone just being like this is the reality of it it's not scary at all there's loads of people doing it but sort of you know, making sure that that's, that's known about. Mm. That's the point. I didn't go to university to, to study music. I didn't, I just left school. I quit really early and got in a band and I went out and I just did all those really, really tough gigs. What sort of gigs that if you can gig there, you can do anywhere. And I, that's how I, create you know really honed my skill and you know yeah i could sing but you know you have to do those sort of gigs in order to learn how your stagecraft you know you don't you know you to perform you have to do, do all that and you have to deal with an audience that aren't watching you how do you get them what do you do you don't just learn that you have to do it you have to be involved in, in order to showcase your skills you might not be able to get any paid work, so you might have to do some favours, and then they will do you a favour back. Then you can use their studio. We don't all have studios to start with, but you know, it's using other people's input, and you give them input, and before you know it, you get a little connection. You get a, there's a way of developing a little family, and it's that sort of family that you need when you're starting out in this industry for support, whether you're a man or a woman. But if you're a woman and you 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 can of course you can get into this industry and if you're good and you just keep doing your work and you work hard you have, and it doesn't matter who you are you have to work hard the harder you work the more you do something the better you become and that goes with everything not just music but you know you know the more you perform the easier it becomes the better it becomes the better you become um, and you know get the I, I did actually make a note about this. Don't be afraid of direction. Don't be afraid of taking some direction and advice and help. That doesn't mean you're weak. You can, I've, I've learned, I'm still learning. I'm, I've been in this business, I'm, I'm 52 and I've been doing this since I was 15 and I'm still learning and I'm still improving in certain elements. It's like, oh my God, I just I started doing this thing. It's great, I'm gonna do this all the time. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you know, and I, so 
you don't know everything. None of us do. We keep learning. We keep going. And that doesn't matter whether you're a male, a man or a woman. You just just focus and keep going. We should all be supporting each other with that, actually. Mm. Especially at the moment, in light of everything that's happening. Absolutely. Um, Jess has asked, I'm sorry if you said this earlier, but where can she find out more about the 2% Rising group? Um, so that group's on Facebook, you can just search 2% Rising, so it's the number two and the percent sign, and then Rising, and you'll find it. Great, I think we've got time for just one more question, which is directed, I think, to Amy um, from Thelma. Um, she said, how do you go about testing the designs and is it an inclusive process? Also, what are the parameters for testing of, um, of the accessibility, especially with musicians with intellectual disabilities or impairments? Yeah, so um, it is an inclusive process and uh, I've been doing this research now with the University of Nottingham's Mixed Reality Laboratory, it's a mouthful, for the last five years. Um, and one of the things that we did was partner with something called um, the, the ABLE Orchestra. So I did some in-person sessions working with uh, a group of young people with a range of complex disabilities uh, both intellectual or physical impairments, and you know a number of number of things. And we go in, we we take a bunch of digital instruments with us. We test what works for people, set them up, and then spend a week learning a piece or creating a piece of music. Um, and the young people involved create everything from um, choosing the soundscape to writing the piece itself, and then we're just there facilitating that. And uh, we actually, in 2016, went to the BBC Proms and they performed on stage there as well. And it was a phenomenal experience. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that I've been looking at through the process because uh, as everybody here has just said, I'm always learning, we're always learning. And the more I learn, the less I know is, is definitely the, the motto of an academic. And that is something that I found all throughout this process and I have been trying to set those parameters because there isn't many people out there looking at accessibility in the music industry in music tech um, a lot of music tech is all about the marketing material as we've talked about and and how flashy it looks or what artists you can get using your kit to make it you know popular and a lot of the things that could be made more accessible are overlooked and so I'm finding those and trying to write and work with companies. Um, and I've worked with quite a few of the big industry leaders as well on this and, and had talks with, you know, Native Instruments are doing great work here. I've talked to the people at Ableton and what they're planning to do for accessibility. It's definitely a hot topic and there's lots of people going more towards it. So hopefully we'll see more inclusion as the years go on, um, both both for more women in tech and more accessible tech as well. Great. I'm going to out, Amy. I'm going to go and check out some of these. I want to I send us some so I can try them out. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's how you do it, guys. <laughs> I can't wait to check out some of your things. It's brilliant. I love it. We've got a session from Drake Music next, specifically on accessibility and inclusion, music tech for learners yeah. with additional needs. So hopefully they'll be able to signpost some good resources. And like I said, for some of the stuff you guys have talked about today, um, I'll try and create a handout to share with the attendees so they can find out more. But it's been a really inspiring uh, panel. Um, I'm sure all the delegates will will agree. And I'm, um, you know, I just want to thank you again for answering all their questions as well. Um, as I've said many times, you'll be able to watch this session back. And the recording will be available via the homepage. Um, but yeah, thanks uh, again everybody for a brilliant brilliant session thank, thank you. you so as i mentioned we don't have an exhibitor slot for the uh for today and so what we're going to do is i'm just going to leave the chat panel open here i'm going to leave this session open so you're all welcome to talk to each other um continue the conversation um, and then come back at about five two i'm going to then start the redirect into the next session so um, if you just leave your screens open, um, we will see you again for the next session from uh, Cassie and B from Drake Music.
Hi everyone. So we'll be starting the next session shortly. Um, we've got music tech for learners with additional needs. Um, and that's going to be with B Hubble and Cassie Gerling of Drake Music. Then after that, we've got music tech for um, early years in primary with uh, Chris from MTech. So two really great sessions. I'm just gonna pop the instructions on the screen of how to get into the next session. So as always, don't close your browser um, because after a short pause, you'll be redirected onto the landing page for the next session. So once you've been redirected, you can click the enter now button to enter the waiting room. Um, and if you aren't redirected, that's also not a problem. Just head back to the landing page um, of the conference and then click enter now there. Uh, the landing page is just on the screen now. Um, I can see that someone's asked about the handouts from all the sessions. So I'm just gonna quickly, before we redirect, I'm gonna show you um, the screen again where I, I've highlighted where the handouts are. So basically, when you go to watch the session on demand, um, so the recording of the session, which are all available via the landing page, just click on the tile for one of the speakers and at the top, you'll see the recording. Um, you'll need to pop in your email address again. But once you've clicked, uh, once you've clicked on the recording, you'll see in the bottom right there's a little um, notes icon. That's where you can download all the handouts. So even if you go to the recording just to get the handouts, that's where they are all located. So I'm going to start the uh, redirect now. So see you in the next session. <laughs>